Callie Colver Buffard is a social worker and Canadian certified addiction counselor. She is married and a mom of two sweet, energetic little boys. Callie has been supporting women in the field since 2005. Callie, welcome to Elevating Women's Wellness and thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. So tell us a little bit about yourself and how you became interested in social work and addiction counseling. Well, I've been working in the field for quite some time and it started actually um, in Sudbury. Um, I currently live in Sault Ste. Marie, um, but my career actually started in Sudbury. Um, so I went to school for, um, social service worker and, you know, I've always had a passion since I was really little to listen to people, um, to help. I've always wanted to be, I call myself a helper sometimes, you know, we, I'm a helper. Um, I support people and, uh, specifically women. Um, one of my first placements coming out of school, um, was at uh, Elizabeth Fry Society in Sudbury. And it, it was geared for just strictly women in conflict with the law. And it was my placement. I got employed uh, after my placement. Um, and I really, there were a lot of things that I saw that women were struggling with, um, that needed help with, support. And I just was, I really connected with them. So I continued my career up until now. I've strictly worked with women. I haven't had the opportunity to work with men so much, but maybe that'll be in the future for me. Um, so yeah, I, I started my career in uh, Sudbury and then I moved up north and I worked at a woman's shelter up there and I got wonderful experience and made wonderful friends um, and uh, helped the Aboriginal population um, up there. So it was, it was quite the experience for me. Um, and uh, then I moved down to Sault Ste. Marie and that brought me to um, Bretton House. Uh, I currently work at uh, Bretton House, um, but I work for a program here called A New Link. Um, so that's pretty much where I started and now I'm here and I'm I'm, I'm very happy. Again, I'm still working with, with women, uh, specifically now just with moms. Um, I'm, I'm sure we'll get a little bit more into that, you know, specifically what I'm working with. Um, yeah, my, I mean, my little boys, uh, they keep me busy and, and you know, uh, a full-time career and a full-time mom at the same time. Um, I see, you know, I see what moms need, uh, what they struggle with, the supports, um, so I have that relation, which is really nice, but I've just always had a really, uh, strong connection and passion to, you know, assist women specifically. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing more about your story. I love your description of helper. And I think that's, you know, maybe an apt description for many people that they could relate to who work in healthcare in some way, shape or form. Um, and I identity that many women in healthcare might relate to. And um, I love the experiences you had too. It sounds like they were varied, diverse, but um, in alignment with working with women in different populations. Really neat. Yeah, it's given me um, quite a, an experience. And, you know, I get to see things in, you know, different areas of, you know, our province. And, you know, it's almost like looking through a new lens. Because every population that I've with women that I've worked with, you know, their needs are similar, but they are also different at the same time. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. Mm -hmm. um, and I know you mentioned a little bit about this, but who are the typical clients that you work with now? So at a new link, we specifically work with parenting or pregnant moms um, who have substance use issues. So whether um, and their goals can be either abstinence based, meaning that they don't want to use any substance a, substances at all, um, or they are taking a harm reduction approach where they're reducing the harm. Um, but they do have to have children. They don't necessarily have to have their, their children in their care. Uh, they could have adopted. They could be a stepmom. They could um, have lost a baby because that's come up as well, that if she needs support, she was a mom, she's a mom. 
Um, so we look at a large scale. We don't just say, well, you know, you have to, you in order to access our services, you have to have your child, children in your care. Some do, some don't. Um, so that's that's very open for us. Mm-hmm. And we've had we've had calls too where you know I'm not you know my children aren't my biological children but they've been adopted or I'm a stepmom. Can I access your services? And it's absolutely. And they also the criteria too they do um, need help with you know uh, substance use. Well, I think it's great that you have a really clear mandate in the work that you're doing. But it sounds like you know your definition is uh, really inclusive um, and supportive. I think that's wonderful. Yeah, I think so too. You know, it's, it's, it's just, I just find it, it doesn't really discriminate. It's very open, right? Mm -hmm. Hopefully one day we're thinking we can open it up to just women in general, Um, not just moms, moms are, you know, um, but one day in the future, maybe we can just open it up to, you know, women, period. But right now it's just specifically for, for moms. I have a question too to elaborate a little bit further. Can you tell us more about um, the different models of um, addiction support between abstinence and harm reduction? What do those terms mean and what does that look like? So abstinence based is um, they don't, one of their their goals are abstinence based, meaning that they don't want to use any substances at all. They don't want to taper off anything, whatever their drug of choice could be. Um, they just want to cold turkey. I'm done. I don't want to use anything. And that works for some. Um, but some also need to uh, be weaned or tapered off their drug of choice. Um, because quitting all substances sometimes can be incredibly difficult, incredibly difficult um, and not and not realistic for for some. So if you take a harm reduction approach, it's reducing the harm and, you know, okay, so an example, you know, the, their drug of choice might be cocaine, but, you know, they're going to want, we can make a harm reduction plan. Like I'm not going to use as much and I'm going to cut down gradually. And my goal in the end is to be abstinent, but I can't uh, quit immediately all substances. And sometimes that works for some, but some some uh, women need that, no, I have to quit all substances because um, sometimes continuing using um, your substances, it doesn't, you know, it can continue. That, mm-hmm. that goal might not be met to be abstinent. Some women, they want to, you know, still smoke marijuana, you know, and they're, they struggle with um, an opiate per se, you know, but it's okay. What is, what is the one substance that is causing, um, a lot of, you know, your life becoming unmanageable, um, health issues, et cetera, you know, but they're still smoking marijuana. That would be a harm reduction approach and to support them through that. Right. And not, you know, that's okay. If that's your plan, let's do it and let's do it safely. Mm-hmm. And it's, yeah. It sounds like a very client-centered approach where the goal Absolutely. is coming from the client and you're supporting them on that with what might be most realistic or help them meet their goal. Yeah. Yeah. We really hear, um, you know, at a new link, uh, we try to meet them where they're at. There's not, it's their treatment plan or their goals, not ours. Um, it just doesn't, it, I just, I don't think we would be supporting them if it was our agenda. So we try to really client-centered, meet them where they're at, and that's it. There's there's no pressure, no pressure. Mm-hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Mm-hmm. Um, so what are some myths surrounding addiction in women? I think sometimes it can be a topic with lots of stigma and like a very loaded topic, but really mm-hmm. like to bring those myths to light and sort of dispel mm-hmm. them. There are, um, there are quite, you know, there are quite a few um, myths, um, especially with months. Um, So one thing I think one myth would be that, you know, women who are struggling with addiction can't parent. That's not true. They can parent and they're good moms. 
that's another myth, you know, they're, they're, they're functional. They can parent, they can have a life. Um, they can go to work. Um, and um, the one thing that we try to encourage that is that, you know, with support, and the right support, you can, you can keep going forward with your work, education, whatever it is. Um, and that professional women as well, they don't struggle with addiction, right? Professional women, um, teachers, social workers, you name it, that no, they, they don't struggle. Every, it doesn't discriminate. That's what I say to a lot of people is that um, addiction doesn't discriminate. Um, doesn't really care who you are. Um, I often hear a myth that is quite sad that, um, you know, a mom loves the drugs more than her children, and that's not the case. That's really not the case. It's that they have a disease. I believe it's a disease, and it's uncontrollable. She has no control over it and it's taken over her life and it has nothing to do with her children. You know, she loves her children very much. She is a caregiver. She is their mother. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, I think it's important to bring light to those things because um, they could be obstacles uh, from women maybe seeking support or things they might be saying to themselves and um, having that judgment over themselves rather than getting support that they could really benefit from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there is, there is judgment and there is a lot of shame. Mm -hmm. um, right now we just offered a group. We're actually running a group called misunderstood in motherhood about guilt and shame. Um, and, you know, it talks about the shame that mothers feel um because of their addiction and you know things that have happened and um it's really great um but you know and there's such a pressure I think also for moms nowadays um I feel it too as a mom there's just a, a lot of pressure to keep everything together you know we got careers we have marriage we have children um and we need to keep it all together and I don't think I don't think we have to keep it all together all the time. So I think that's another myth too, is that we don't, it's okay to fall apart sometimes mm -hmm. or ask for help and support. Yes. Yeah. So what are signs that a woman that is using substances may uh, benefit from seeking support? A few signs would be that, um, you know, if I'm, if I'm just thinking about, if I'm working with a woman here and I'm just finding, okay, something, something's going on here with her. Um, you know, she starts, she stops coming in for her appointments, um, kind of no phone calls, no, there's no connection there. That would be kind of a, a sign that, you know, she might need some more support. Um, also meeting with them, sometimes they, you're, they're talking and they're putting themselves in really high risk, high risk situations, such as um, old friends, old places, we call it people, places and things. Uh, so if we're talking and they're like, oh, you know, I went here and I met an old friend, that would also be a red flag for me. Um, their mood too, uh, if they become, you know, if their behavior really starts to change, um, that would also be, you know, a sign that they might need a little bit more support. Um, and old behaviors, we really pay attention to the behaviors. Um, so if those start to surface, you know, like not showing up for appointments, not calling if they usually call, um, you know, uh, if they're starting to fight and get have tension with family members, things like that. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah thank you. Also, if they um, can't go days without, you know, um, not using that would also be a warning sign that, you know, they've in increased their use. Mm -hmm. We would definitely, that would be a huge sign that, okay, we need to meet more. You need more help. We need to make a better plan for you. So those are some of the signs that I would look out for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for putting those out. I think it's important for women to have that awareness um, so that 
perhaps they can start looking for those signs themselves too and, and just notice that um, and seek more support. Um, I'm wondering too, from your perspective, why is hope so important uh, for women with addiction? Well, because sometimes that's all they have is hope. And, and uh, you know, we empower with hope that there's always hope. There is, we don't give up. You dust yourself off and you get back up again. And they've lost, they could, they, they could have lost a lot and having hope, having faith that, you know what, this too shall pass. It will get better. This too shall pass and providing them that hope and encouraging them and empowering them and saying, you can, if this is what you want, if this is, or if these are your goals, give them that hope that it is possible, that change is possible if that's what they choose. And that's what we're here to do is we're here to promote that hope and empower with hope, mm -hmm. right? Um, because sometimes they feel hopeless. They don't, they feel like they're, you know, hitting a, you know, a brick wall over and over again. Sometimes they need that encouragement to, hey, keep going, keep going, keep going. You got this. You got this. Let's plug you into different agencies in the community. Yeah. Yeah. And we provide that for them. You know, we really do. We're really on their side. I guess that that's our, that's actually our motto here. We're not on your back. We're on your side. Mm, that's a good one. I like yeah. that. I think yeah. that describes well, um, what you really offer and how you're there for women. Um, I'm wondering too, along with hope, what does a woman need to successfully meet her goals with um, addiction recovery? The one thing, the biggest thing I think is she cannot do it alone. Mm. She cannot do it alone. A circle of support, you know, around her. And that has, to, I think that has to be in place positive people, positive friends, doctors, psychiatrists, counselors, if they choose fellowship like AA or NA, um, groups, um, support uh, women's groups, support groups. We run a support group here for women. Um, they can't do it alone. Yeah. That's the, that's the, I think that's the biggest thing and surrounding yourself with positive the right people, positive people who are in the same mindset as yourself. And the biggest thing is to just walk through our doors, ring our doorbell. We'll open your, we'll open the doors. We had a, we had a, a young lady the other day um, come and just unexpectedly. And uh, you know, she was in, she was in rough shape, really rough shape, sad, scary almost. And we let her in and we gave her some water and a granola bar and you know she made an appointment with me didn't show up the next day but that's okay she knows that she can come back because we opened that door we made sure that she was safe we gave her a cab home because we wanted her somewhere safe worried about her getting home and I'm hopeful that she'll come back mm -hmm. and whether it's to get some water or to get a, a granola bar or a little bit of food and be on her way and maybe one day she'll make the appointment with me or she'll show up and be like I'm ready and guess what we're gonna be here we're not going anywhere yeah yeah that's amazing um I think it's important to have those things of light in our community and to know that the door is always open you know I think that's a great symbol too mm -hmm. yeah I think so too um I'm wondering too about what codependency is and how does it relate to addiction? Because I know codependency is something that's talked about a lot um, related to addiction. And I, I want to make sure that our audience has a understanding of that. So we have a really, I got excited about this because codependency for years, it, it can be, uh, it can be really broad, right? What's codependency? And I'm going to tell you and the audience, Brene Brown. I'm not sure if anybody's familiar. We love her here. We love Brene Brown. She describes codependency in a couple of words, and it is perfect for me. Anyways, codependency is the disease to please. Mm, yeah. So that means that you are, you don't think about yourself. 
you are always putting others first. Um, you are constantly trying to people please and to fix and to save. Um, it is, it is the disease to please. And you can get lost in that if you are a loved one or a friend because you have your family member, friend, whoever it is, who's struggling and you love them so much and you want to get better. Mm. But you forget about yourself in the meantime, all your focus, all your energy is going into that person. You don't put your needs, you don't, you don't put your needs first. You're kind of on the back burner, you know, um, putting, putting themselves too in high risk situations, not thinking about themselves, not putting themselves first. So they go hand in hand. Yes. Because someone, someone who's struggling with substance use and you have someone who's very codependent, usually they know that they're going to be able to, you know, get what they want, get what they need, because this person wants to I, overly help, if that makes any sense, yeah. overly help, it has no boundaries. There we go. That's what I'm thinking. No, there's no boundaries, mm -hmm. no boundaries. Mm -hmm. So that would be my definition. Makes sense. And I, I love Brandy Brown too. I think mm. in, in her research, she's brought uh, so much clarity to all different things like, you know, vulnerability, shame, yes, uh, all that amazing work. And I love, I think that's such an apt definition of codependence. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, also wondering, cause you know, life ebbs and flows, challenges will come our way. Um, how might women adapt their self-care practices in times of high stress? Right, that's hard, eh? I think that, and I mean, I struggle with this myself, uh, you have to make the time. You have to make the time for yourself and self-care. Um, you have to put yourself first sometimes, ask for what you need, ask for what you want. Um, practice self-care, whatever it is, whether it's exercising, whether it's talking to somebody, um, whatever, yoga, whatever it is, um, it's important to reach out, self-care, ask for help, mm -hmm. ask for help. That's the biggest thing. So self-care and asking for help from a friend, family member, a sponsor, someone, you know, in a woman's circle, but yeah, self-care is really important. It's hard when you have all these other responsibilities as a mother, children, a job, everyday life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, there can be so many different elements. And I think it's important to, you know, kind of tying in what you said earlier that women struggling with addiction, I think even just women in general, we need a circle of care. We need yes. surrounding us and asking for help means having other people in your corner who are like-minded and are willing to be there. And I think it also even ties back to codependency because sometimes women might hesitate to reach out for help if they think that might displease someone else, right? Or they're a burden or whatever right. other things women might tell themselves that aren't true, right? Yeah. That's so true. You know, and you use the word burden and I was like, that, that's true too. And, you know, going back to the myths, you know, that was a huge myth that you're not, they're not a burden, but they think that, right. I don't want to ask. I don't want to reach out. I don't want to bug them. I hear that a lot. Oh, I didn't want to bug anybody. I didn't want to bother you. I didn't want to disturb you. And it's like, ah, you have to, you're not a burden. No matter how many times I tell them to call, you're not a burden, but they think that, right. So yeah, I'm glad you pointed that out. Yeah, absolutely. I, I hear it a lot too in my work. And so that's where that um, experience comes from. It's informed by my work as well. And I, you know, I just, I hear it so often. So I think it's important to, again, like it's just yet another myth, um, important to clear that up so that we know we can all access each other's support, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I have a couple more questions for you. Earlier, you had mentioned um, that addiction is a disease. What is it important for us as women to know about the disease of addiction? Well, I think I, um, that, I, think I said it earlier that it, it doesn't discriminate. Yeah. Um, that it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you are a mom. It doesn't matter if... It, 
you know, it doesn't matter. I, I also hear too, well, you know, I, I didn't have any trauma in my life. I came up from a, a good upbringing mm. or, you know, nothing's wrong with me. It doesn't matter. It doesn't care. It doesn't discriminate. You could have grown up and, you know, have a perfect life, whatever that is, um, you know, and no trauma and it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't discriminate. Um, and that they're not bad women who are, uh, anybody for that matter, who are struggling with addiction. Uh, they're good people. They're really good people. They're really genuine people, but they're sick. Mm-hmm. And they're just trying to get better. Yeah. Yeah. They're just trying to get better. That's all they're trying to do. Just like a cancer patient, right? Mm-hmm. They're just trying to get better too. Yeah. It's not their fault. They cannot control it. And I know that's hard to understand mm-hmm. for some that, oh, well, it's a choice. I hear that too. It's a choice. I believe it's not. I believe it is a disease and it's an uncontrollable. Like they have no control. Mm-hmm. It controls them. The drugs control them yes yes thank you and yeah 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 it's important to know for sure um then I have a final question for you as well resilience is a topic that's near and dear to my heart and is so Mm -hmm. important for women's wellness Mm -hmm. Um, what does becoming more resilient mean to you and how does this relate to the women that you work with Mm, more resilient I love that word. Um, again, it's an empowering, giving them that hope. Um, I also say when they, when a relapse happens, that's okay. No worries. No problem. You get up, you dust yourself off and you try again mm-hmm. yeah. to, to help them with that strength and that resilience. Um, praise, praise more shame less Mm. yes that's a big thing is let's focus on what you've done right and not what you've done wrong Mm -hmm. because they already have so much guilt so much shame so much hurt and you know what let's focus on what you've done right so I always think in my head praise more shame less they're already feeling that shame. They're already feeling that guilt. I don't need, I don't need to add to that. So, um, and I think building them up instead of building them down or knocking them down kind of, you know, and whether that's, you know what you positive affirmations, Mm -hmm. just giving them, I tell them, you know, anytime you need a pep talk, give me a call. I'm your cheerleader. You got this. You can do it you know, a lot of encouraging, a lot of encouraging and praising, yeah. how to build that self-confidence and self-esteem. And we can do that together with them. So true. So true. Um, well, I love your definition of what it means to become more resilient. I think it's so important and the work that you're doing. Thank you so much, Callie, for sharing your wisdom today, your experience. Um, just so glad that we have you in our community. Oh, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. And, you know, thanks for chatting with me and uh, letting you know about Tanu Link and Bratton House. And it was a pleasure. Thanks so much. 